Hey, Annie, guess what? What? We just launched a business of biotech newsletter. Yeah? Yeah. I know what you're thinking. What am I thinking? We don't need another <laughs> newsletter. Yeah, I might have been thinking that. Annie, I swear on my grandpa's grave, you're going to like this newsletter. That's a pretty bold swear, Matt. Uh, hear me out. It's monthly. Only once a month. It's ad-free. And it's modeled after the Business of Biotech podcast. It's got the same insight from the builders of biotech that you see in the podcast. So what's not to like? That actually sounds like it doesn't suck. Pretty high praise, Annie. Check it out. Bioprocessonline.com backslash B-O-B. Go there and sign up for this newsletter. You won't regret it. With the approval of Novartis's Kim Raya back in 2017, CAR T cell therapies looked poised to do great things in the immuno-oncology space. And indeed, a handful of other CAR Ts have made their way to market for the treatment of lymphomas and myeloma. But that commercial success comes with a few caveats. These treatments are difficult and time-consuming to produce. They're expensive. They come with considerable patient safety risks, and their application is limited to blood cancers. But more recently, there's been a big push by dozens of drug developers to expand the application of CAR T cell therapies to solid tumors and, in some cases, to do it in vivo, an approach that could inherently minimize the complexity, safety concerns, and costs associated with the therapy. I'm Matt Pillar. This is the Business of Biotech, and joining me in the studio today is David Fontana, Chief Operating Officer at one such developer called Umoja Biopharma. Umoja is an early stage company that's well positioned to make an impact on the advance of in vivo CAR T cell therapies with a healthy cash runway and a brand new 146,000 square foot facility to support its efforts. On today's show, we're going to get to know Dr. Fontana. We're going to learn about Umoja's approach to improving CAR the CAR T paradigm. And I'm welcoming today Dr. Fontana. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, Matt. Great to be here with you today. From wonderful Seattle, Washington. Well, it's good to have you uh, on the show. And um, I'll just share with the audience real quick. David was sharing with me before we started to record that he just returned last night from a, a, a nice trip to France with his wife. So welcome. Welcome back stateside, David. I hope it was a great time. Of course. Yeah. Um, so I want to I want to start by getting to know you a little bit better. You know, you one of the things that struck me about your background when I when I kind of did, did a little research on you was that um, you know your 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 pedigree in biopharma is like it's it's you know it it, it, it you've got this long chain sort of uh, you know big companies Sanofi, Cgen, Pfizer, Juno, BMS, uh, and others. Um, it, it, you know, there, there's quite a breadth there. So I'm curious what, what sort of common thread weaves through all those, the, your journey through all those, uh, those companies. Yeah, that's a good question, Matt. Um, I've been doing a lot of reflecting lately, particularly when I was on that nice trip in France about my career. And one, one theme that's really obvious to me was the idea about exploration. So I, I really enjoyed getting out there and exploring different uh, companies and different people and getting to know different uh, technologies. And, and I can say I've been very lucky and to work with so many wonderful people with common purpose. Now, if I drill a little bit deeper, I think one of the biggest themes of that all of that um, career was really related to relationships and partnerships. Uh, early in my career, I developed an affinity for working in partnerships. Uh, I was a young buck working for a company called Syntex in Palo Alto, California. And we had a relationship with a long gone company called Synergen. And we were working together with, you know, on growth factors, nerve growth factor and CTNF. It's just a wonderful eye-opening experience for me. And frankly, I've never looked back over the you know last dozen of years. I've either led or been a part of some of the biggest and most productive relationships in industry. Um, you, you touched a few, you know, but the cell gene Juno, right, just led to, um, you know, two good products you know, to the market. Uh, Pfizer and Merck uh, AG for the uh, product uh, that I worked on, a value map back there, right? Big programs, you know, beautiful relationships, but even back, you know, to the days of Millennium and um, Aventus, there's a big collaboration with those companies that led to great stuff. And then obviously Seijin and Takeda with et cetera, just led to the opportunity to bring people together, you know, common purpose and, and uh, you know, explore and get things done. It's been a yeah. fascinating road for me. 
It's it's been interesting, you know, as I've uh, interviewed multiple uh, leaders at, at biopharma companies over the course of this podcast project, just to see uh, how how many doors open, uh, you know, to 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 realize just how many avenues you can take, and you know, some folks do, some folks don't. You know, you and I were talking about Steve Davidson, who spent 38 years at AbV, and he's still there, right? But most of the folks I talk to kind of move around a lot. But one, uh, you know, I, I guess I, another I, unique thing about about you. David is, you know, you, you came into the space with a pharmacology degree and, you know, you're, you're working in ATMPs, you know, with some pretty cutting edge new, new modalities. Um, it seems like this is completely anecdotal, right? Like, so, you know, but just, just based on observation, it seems like when I'm talking with, uh, the leaders of ATMP companies, they're the ones who come at it from like all, all, all over the board. A lot of them are like entrepreneurs who don't have science backgrounds. A lot of them are like, you know, some of the new, um, the, the new academic, uh, I guess, courses of study that come out of, uh, you know, the combination of computational biology and, um, you know, the, these, these kind of cutting edge or, or really diverse backgrounds. Uh, and, and when I have like a pharmacologist on, you know, they're usually coming from sort of the, the small mall world, maybe, you know what I mean? So it, it piques my curiosity. It's sort of an ill-formed question, but it piques my curiosity around what it's like um, kind of coming academically out of a pharmacology world and, and moving, you know, through a career that's been largely, I mean, you've worked across modalities, but it's, uh, quite a bit of it's been focused in cell and gene and, and more advanced therapies. Um, is there a story there? Or am I just making that up in my head? No, quite an interesting story, I, I believe. Um, my, my degree is actually in pharmaceutical sciences, so it's a little bit broader than even pharmacology, which meant, you know, very therapeutic uh, focused. I was, I, you know, was trained in pharmacokinetics, uh, drug interactions, um, a lot of work on drug metabolism and uh, various pharmacology, um, you know, aspects. I haven't done shield plot analyses or PK analysis in over 25 years. So I'd say from that angle, probably my degree in training was, um, was uh, you know, has minimal impact. It would have been better to be an immunologist, of course, today, all these kids coming out of the University of Washington and Seattle Children's are just, you know, uh, whiz kids at this one. But I, th I think really, it really focused my career early on be getting involved in therapeutics. I, I, I was involved in therapeutics. Most of my coursework was with uh, very you know, smart pharmacy students or med students trying to learn about the therapeutical therapeutic aspects and a lot less uh, in, in the areas of um, you know, the traditional immunology degrees would give on basic science and things like that. So I was really applied. And I think that that played over. You know, I went to school, if you, if you don't mind entertaining me for a second, because I- No, that's, of, right? <laughs> that's why we're having you on the show, Dr. Yeah, yeah. Fontana, by all yeah. means. I sure thing. You know, I went to went to school at Wayne State University in, in Detroit, Michigan. You know, it was a commuter school. I was a, a city guy, you know, so I didn't have the uh, distractions, one could say, of, um, you know, University of Michigan football or frat parties. Or, and, you know, so mm. we, we were basically in and out kids, right? We commuted back and forth. And um, but it did offer me the opportunity to still get involved in lab work very early. You know, I was an undergrad you know, working at you know, two or three different lab jobs at the time because there was a lot, a lot of opportunity and very little competition to do those type jobs. I, I recall um, working on really uh, as just a young buck in maybe my first year of college at, at a place called Lafayette Clinic. It was a psychiatric hospital right across the street from Wayne State. Um, and I uh, attained a job there working with a uh, uh, neuropsychiatrist. We were doing looking at the effects of antidepressants on the pineal levels of serotonin. You know, I didn't even know what a pineal gland was at the time. And it just parlayed into a whole bunch of creative opportunities to meet up to to apply uh, work. You know, I did everything from cardiovascular work with um, um, you know, anesthesiologists to uh, just great work on uh, you know, drug addiction in monkeys to uh, surgery mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of opportunities that I think Wayne State you know, offered me. But most of it was um, you know, thera therapeutically based. And, and during my PhD time, I actually applied for a grant. Um, and this really will, will come back home. I was thinking about this too on my trip. I applied for a grant and won a, a screening grant to look at um, Bristol Myers Squibb's host of antidepressants um, and anti-anxiety drugs through all these models I was developing at Wayne State. You know, look, looking at the efficacy of bupropion and these various drugs, and you play forward. I've been part of Bristol Myers Squibb for over you know, twice now for over ten years through acquisition. I mm. never put an application in, but one company has really impacted my life because that that set the tone for me to be involved. I, I knew at that point in time, I wanted to be involved in applied research and, and really make drugs, discover drugs and develop drugs. 
instead of being a, a basic researcher and finding new neural, neural pathways, whatever. So, um, uh, you know, long-winded way to say, I think it, um, I was really involved in therapeutics early and the basic research kind of got drilled out of me and it was more therapeutically focused, which shaped my entire career. Just, I, I've loved drug screening. I've loved drug development and never looked back. Yeah, that's it's that's fascinating. Um, I mean, the, you know, the big takeaway being o open eyes and, and 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 embracing opportunities. You know, to to learn more and 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 uh, and adjust and pivot. Um, I'm I'm curious though, like uh, along that path, when you started to get into the the advanced therapeutic space, were were there any? I guess. I don't know, inherent challenges given where you would come from or what your, you know, your diverse fields of study had been previously? Um, or, you know, e even if you can't put, you know, pinpoint a specific challenge, sort of what, what did you learn along the way that you might, advice you might give someone who's kind of coming from, I don't know, pharmaceutical sciences background or, or some background that's not that, you know, immuno-oncology kind of whiz kid that you, that you mentioned uh, coming into this, this, this cutting edge science space? Oh, that's a wonderful question. I, I do a lot of mentoring, and one of my biggest messages is, is exactly that. Just push yourself, right? Explore as much as you can and, and develop mentors. A lot of my mentors were the junior people. I have to say this even at, at Umoja today, and at Juno for certain, it was was the, um, the, the immunologist coming out of the lab who knew 100 times more immunology and about, uh, I was the fortunate to be involved heavily with the Bristol-Myers Squibb you know, um, IO port portfolio, right? We'll come, um, I'm sure we'll come back to that later, but really just picking up people who worked on the various molecules as postdocs themselves and befriending them and you know, and having uh, really opportunity to, to be mentored by um, all levels of people, right? Mentorship doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to come from you know, bosses or supervisor. Most of my learnings in the, the space have come from the more junior folks who just, you know, have specialties in areas that are, are out there now that weren't out there in my day and just been fantastic opportunity to learn across yeah. the board. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. That's cool. Check your egos at the door. Check your egos at the door. Don't be afraid to learn from the new guys. Yeah. That's uh, the exactly. new young guys. That's exactly. good. Yeah, you've, you, uh, you know, over the course of your career, as we've ascertained, you've seen a lot of different modalities. You've worked on big milestones, uh, seen, seen quite a few different modalities through big milestones. Um, from MAPS to ADCs uh, and now cell therapies. Um, you know, I, I'm sure this question is kind of like asking you to pick your favorite kid and tell us why. But uh, when you look at, you know, the, your experience with these different modalities, do you have any favorites to work in or favorite experiences historically that uh, stand out? Yeah. I'll probably give you the answer. I give you, I have two wonderful daughters and a 25 year old kid, so I'm really proud of. So I'd give you the same answer that I'd give them. Uh, love the one you're with, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> the one I'm with today. You know, I, I have found it just amazing everything from my early days uh, of working at Elza. And you probably don't even remember Elza. Most folks probably don't. It was a delivery system company, right? I, I came from a laboratory position, moved over to Elza to work on a product called Concerta for attention deficit disorder, right? It was a no very novel delivery system that, you know, brought my pharmacokinetics training in, my neuroscience background, and, uh, you know, working from that perspective to, uh, you know, proteins, working on the first biologic uh, that Aventus uh, had with the, um, the gene-activated epigen and nupigen molecules were great. But but clearly my favorite and most productive time has been, you know, the last 15 to 16 years with, um, I had the fortune to come out to work at a company called Zymo Genetics, uh, Zymo Genetics right here on South Lake Union in Seattle had a uh, wonderful immunology portfolio, most of it autoimmune, but, um, you know, I was really focused more on the um, immunology for treating virology, uh, you know, virology and cancer diseases. We had IL-21 uh, molecule, an early cytokine, like one of the ba most basic immune oncology drugs you could get to besides IL-2, and um, you know, parlay that into an acquisition, and then I you know, basically got to work on the checkpoint inhibitors, you know, throughout my career. I kind of stumbled into that, right? It was just fortunate, I, good character. They, they liked what I was bringing to the table. And they, they handed me the keys to a program called LAG3. And that's where I really got you know, my, my teeth wet or, you know, or, or got my feet, you know, hands wet with, uh, you know, the immune oncology field, just working on the LAG3 program. It was, the, you know, the third checkpoint inhibitor that Bristol-Meyer had behind, beside CTLA-4, the, the uh, and the uh, PD-1 inhibitor, right, Optivo. And so I you know, drove that really quickly to do combination work with um, 
with the uh, Optivo molecule. And you, if you don't know, it just got approved for melanoma last year. Really, I love this creative name. That's why I brought it up for one thing is, you know, it's, it's a combination of basically sold in a single vial of two biologics of Optivo and LAG3, and it's called uh, Opdulag. Mm. Optilag, so Optivo and, and LAG3, and it's for melanoma patients, just making a world of difference. And frankly, I think that's that was really transformational, as all, we all know, for the field. But by far, I think my, my proudest moments in my career were around the cell therapy. I remember leaving Pfizer, you know, leaving the, the immunology job I had at Pfizer, or immune oncology job at Pfizer, and my boss at the time, Dr. Chris Boshoff, just a wonderful brain and, and drug developer at Advisor told me you're never going to be able to manufacture those things, and you know I, I come over to Juno, and he's he's mostly right, right? He's mostly right. It, it just took forever to manufacture those things, but just you know, sitting here today, looking back at you know the fact that we've provided curative therapies and these aggressive large B cell lymphoma diseases, you know follicular lymphoma, you know you're starting to meet people now that were treated with your drugs, right? There's, there's a person at our company that was treated with. Um, you know, the, the, the molecules we worked on at Juno. So it's just mm. fantastic you know, to have that whole um, you know, cycle. So I think the cell therapy has really been the most you know, transformational to be some, you know, to look at people in the, in the face and said, you've been you know, cancer free for five years. It's just a wonderful feeling. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. That, yeah, that, that's super cool. That you work with someone who it was, was treated with a, you know, with a, with a therapeutic that you contributed to. And as I said, you've contributed to many, um, you know, while you're at BMS, I noted that you, you worked with the team that took Brianzi, Brianzi, am I pronouncing that correctly? Brianzi. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Good. Um, from you, you worked with a team that took that that product from uh, clinical evaluation to commercialization. I don't know. Like I said, I could pick. I could. I could probably pick any one uh, molecule or therapeutic that you worked on and ask you for your just perspective on you know what it's like to work on something to take it uh, all all the way through. Um, but that's the one I picked. So uh, t- tell us about that experience. Tell us about like how how an experience like that, what you learn from it, and how it drives your your move forward. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that was just a remarkable experience. Again, going into it a bit naive, thinking of this you know, um, with a, with a cockiness of coming from an immune oncology unit at Bristol Myers Squibb that could do no wrong, and the same advisor, right? Just remarkable companies could do no wrong to join a brand new space, you know, along with our colleagues at Kite and Novartis, right? We're just developing a brand new brand new space. So we adopted a you know, we adopted a manufacturing process out of Seattle Children's. You know, spent you know uh, Brianzi or, or it's. You know, the other name we call it is Lysocell or JCAR17 or uh, Lysocaptogene Maralucell, all the great names, but I'll, I'll uh, refer to it as Brianzi. You know, just went through four evolutions of manufacturing to, to increase the effectiveness and cost effectiveness, which, which also included you know, uh, two different or three different vector manufacturers, right? Mid-course having to change because manufacturing was, was a uh, difficult uh, trait. And at the same time, you know, the FDA was learning these modalities like we were, right? I remember the first few FDA meetings were, were really a mess, uh, like disappointing for both sides because we were we were new to it. You know, we thought we knew everything. We clearly knew a lot more than them because we you know, we had two molecules, two, two CD19 molecules. You know, we knew a lot and they were getting up to speed. You know, what, what's remarkable by the end, you know, by the end of uh, you know, the time with you know, Bristol after the approval and getting into the second line approval, you know, the FDA caught up, right? And, and we were working together really nicely at the tail end of things. Yeah, but also came with, um, you know, a, a wonderful set of people, right? You know, the Juno um, acquisition, we, you know, it's also a little heartbreaking that we lost a lot of the Juno team. We built a wonderful team and, and probably you know, one of the most ambitious uh, set of characters um, you can see. And it really has stimulated a lot of the the activity in the biotech space in Seattle and San Francisco was based on, you know, the, the folks from Juno. That, that was actually fantastic, Matt, just to, to work with those people. But it was a lot of loss, right? You build relationships and then you're moving on. But I, I can say I, I didn't miss a beat. I really enjoyed working with Celgene and the expertise that they brought in, and with all of their hematological experience. This was you know, a remarkable experience, very welcoming group. And then with you know Bristol, uh, Meyer Squibb, again, bringing in all the immunology experience and the regulatory know-how, it, w- it was absolutely wonderful uh, to go through there. And what I, you know, it's so getting a molecule, you know, from the beginning with the Seattle children's process with four different versions doing, you know, stop and starts with three different uh, uh, vector manufacturers, two acquisitions later, <laughs> um, yeah. getting to the finish line was, was you know, super remarkable. You know, it's super remarkable. And you probably, you're probably aware that, you know, 
um, the Kite and, and Bristol Myers Squibb have gained approval now in second line uh, therapies and, and you know versus um, you know, stem cell transplant, right? Something that no one ever thought was a challenge, and it wasn't just an approval; it was uh, you know basically a home run. You know, uh, uh, hazard ratios of 0.35 or less. You know, overall PFS benefit, a survival benefit. In, in, the, in the Brianzi case too, we did that both in you know in transplant eligible patients, but also the fragile you know, less um, optimized patients for uh, non-transplant eligible patients. We, we showed, you know, great efficacy there. So really transformed, you know, transformed the field. And it took a lot of patients, right? A lot of, pa not you know, patients, both in patients, <laughs> recruiting mm -hmm. patients, but a lot of patients by the, you know, sister companies and the, the staff to stay together through all the ups and downs and roller coasters that we've been through with, you know, these married molecules. And Kite and Novartis, I'm sure it lived the same it absolutely the same up and downs. We all tell a great story today, but it was, right. it was tumultuous and, and really a you know, fun, exciting ride and, and toughened us all up pretty well. Yeah, I can imagine. And I, you know, I want to, that's a, that's a beautiful segue, I think. Um, to, I want to start spending some time here talking about what's going on at Umoja. Um, and I, and I think that's a beautiful segue because you've lived through, you know, the ups and downs, as you said, the, the, the pain you've, you know, it's sort of, sort of girded you, I, I would say perhaps yeah. to embrace a, a, a new challenge. And that's sort of this next generation of, uh, of CAR T, uh, therapies. Um, is that what, is that sort of what brought you to Umoja? What was the story there? Like, what was it? Okay. You know, we've, we've, we've conquered some things, made some progress here. There's a new challenge. There's a new opportunity, uh, right? Like uh, the opportunity to, uh, extend the benefit of, of CAR T cell therapies a number of ways to a number of new indications. Uh, what was that? Was that kind of what drove you to to make that move? Yeah, you know, you know, coming off the success of the of the autologous cars, I, I was really looking at what else could I do at Bristol Myers Squibb, and you know, I was pretty locked into staying on the West Coast and, and particularly you know Seattle. Love the environment here with you know the, the biotech and my uh, you know my network here, and really wanted to to stay in the field. And and one of the um, early Mohicans uh, at Juno, who's, who's the CMC lead, a guy named Ryan Christman, started, a, you know, was, was one of the co-founders of Umoja. And he, we kept in touch and he re basically recruited me to come over and help out here. And it wasn't really a hard sell because, you know, the, the idea of, um, you know, these, these autologous cars were something I never would, would have imagined 15 years ago, let alone 10 years ago. And then the idea of doing things in vivo or just seemed like the right approach, you know, taking a lot of the, uh, burden off there. And then when I got to meet the team, you know, just the, our CEO, Andy uh, Scharenberg, just fantastic scientist, probably the best scientist I've worked with. And the, the company all exudes what he brings to it. It's just, uh, you know, foundational science is something um, I didn't miss a beat from the Juno days and, and BMS days. It felt like I was in the same Zoom calls. I also have to say too, he cheated. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of folks, we, we brought over um, a lot of uh, team members from the Brianzi team to Emoja, you know, my regulatory lead, the clinical lead, the manufacturing lead, you know, so, so the, the, the first few calls of Emoja were more like a Brianzi team meeting than uh, probably the Brianzi world. That's, we, we cheated a bit, but you know, that, that's, I think what, what drives us well, we, we all know what we're doing. We've got, you know, veterans, some people have worked on, you know, both the Dendrion product and then they moved over to Brianzi. So they've had you know, 15 and 20 years of you know, regulatory interactions, which makes a difference. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't call, I wouldn't consider that cheating, by the way, Dr. Fontana, I, I would consider that smart, smart, uh, you know, sound, sound business strategy. If I, if I was going to walk away from, uh, you know, from, from this desk and, and launch something new in the, in a similar field, I, I could, I'm not going to name names right now, but I could, I, I could give you a short list of folks I'd want to take with me. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we name names. We, 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 we picked our favorites. <laughs> we got them. Yeah. So that, that's a smart thing. It's just wonderful too. Just, just our level of, you're right. Our level of ability to work together, to cut to the chase. We know work styles, which obviously takes time to develop, but just, just the, the fact that we know who can contribute, who can write, who can't write, who can edit, who knows how to handle what has just been remarkable. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's really to your point, as I, I say the kind of kiddling, but it really did set up Emoja for great success you know, and looking forward just yeah. our, our team is dynamic and the research is phenomenal is there a story behind the name by the way yeah i like to share that story so it was, it was founded um you know, by by um andy scharenberg as i mentioned um phil lau from purdue who brings our tumor tag technologies he started endocyte and that got bought by Novartis. he brings uh, you know one of our technologies and then our, our one of our 
uh, co-founders, Mike Jensen, right? Mike Jensen, who also co-founded Juno from Seattle Children's, came up with the name Umoja, and it's Swahili for unity. Hmm. And, it, and the idea behind that was that um, they all got together and said, we need to bring, you know, uh, to solve the problems we see with autologous cars and immune therapies, we need to bring several technologies together in, in a unified way. And so that's, it was kind of a nice play on, on, on that. I mean, unity, and now we use it as our unity and team and you know, unity with partnerships and um, the technologies clearly go together as, as we'll probably get into next. When you're striving to excel in a new arena, the best guides are the ones already doing it well. The business of biotech brings those voices forward to help new and emerging biopharmas turn their innovations like mRNA and cell and gene therapies into clinical realities. Tune in and subscribe for insights on hiring, regulatory, and other need to know topics for biopharma leaders. The podcast is brought to you in collaboration with Cytiva. Check out their resources at cytiva.com backslash emerging biotech. That's C-Y-T-I-V-A dot com backslash Emerging Biotech. Yeah, yeah, I like it. Yeah, and before we get into those technologies, I want to talk about what's uh, what's what's driving, I guess, at the ground level. <clears throat> excuse me, some of those some of those technologies, and that's a healthy dose of funding. Uh, you guys just last summer wrapped up an oversubscribed two hundred and ten million dollar Series B, and I'm assuming that that's closely tied to where we're going next with the conversation about the uh, development of the platform, the facility, that kind of thing. But you tell me what um, you know. Aside from uh, you know, attracting talent such as yourself and and, and several other <laughs> other people from uh, from that Brianzi team. Uh, what's that, what's that money earmarked for? So our series B was, was, you know, very healthy prescribed our, our, we got a great set of investors, very supportive across the board, both series A and series B and the future of Emoja and, and uh, very, very involved board, just fantastic uh, group of folks. Um, but we spent, um, we made a tactical decision right when I joined, I mean, a strategic decision right when I joined to invest in our own manufacturing. But the rest of the money is really going towards our pipeline development of a molecule called VV200, which um, can be 200 is really uh, a play with our autologous it's our eraser, which is our ability to grow the cells. And, um, and then the tumor tag technology is all involved in what we call VB200, um, the program. So that's our lead program. And um, we're really working aggressively towards INT at that. And then finally, I just wanted to mention, you know, uh, a part of our funding really went towards working with Dr. Mike Jensen in Seattle, at Seattle Children's Unit on a cl clinical trial called Enlighten. And Enlighten trial um, doesn't use our in vivo technology, but it uses our tumor tag technology, particularly the tumor tag called a folate tumor tag, which hits the folate receptor. And the folate receptor is known you know, to be involved in lots of different tumors, but in this case is particularly involved in uh, pediatric osteosarcoma. So we have a trial ongoing. We've, we're enrolling patients and have already treated a few patients now with Mike Jensen at Seattle Children's um, with our tumor tag and his autologous car. So that's really, really the money is going towards. And the whole purpose of that is to get a good feel of how these tumor tags work with the cars. And then of course, if we get activity, um, we'll know a lot about how do you treat with this tumor tag and we can move into our in vivo systems or, or continue to play out. So a lot of the money is really going towards um, expanding of the pipeline, um, building our technologies. We have the, you know, the, the, a lot of funding, but we also have a lot of technologies that need, you know, mentoring and moving along and coaching through the, uh, you know, the pipeline. So we're spending, uh, you know, we've got 130, 540 folks working on stuff with the manufacturing crew and, and three or four different technologies going on. So lots going on at Emoja to, to spend that money. Seems yeah. like a lot, but uh, we, we get reminded a lot that our burn rate is always too high. So wow. I'm sure you hear that from a lot of little little guys these days. The burn rate's too high. <laughs> for, yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, you know, you, you gotta you gotta you gotta spend money to to do good things. So it's totally understandable. Okay. So yeah, you guys you decided to 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 spend the money on your own manufacturing facility and de develop in house. And I'm always interested in those decisions because in this day and age, I you know every single day I get like, I, I swear to God, there's like 300 million new square feet of outsourcing space being produced on a daily basis. If you judge by the press releases that come across yeah. my desk, um, so what sort of led to the decision to to spend that money and and develop internally? Why'd you choose to do that? Yeah, uh, the biggest factor in that decision was really our based on our experiences with Brianzi, just um, having to rely on contract manufacturing for our vector manufacturing in particular uh, was difficult, and we had a lot of stops and starts, and you know, and some delays associated with you know not being able to control our own schedule. And as um, 
our, our whole technology is really based on being able to manufacture things um, you know, in efficient ways and to try to, to democratize our entire platforms. And our drug product is our, our basically our manufacturing product ends up with lentiviral vectors products called VivoVec. And that's really our drug products. What we're giving right into patients is not cells. We're giving you know, these VivoVec lentiviral particles. So controlling that whole supply chain was one of the goals of Emoja. A tough decision, and of course, with the economic downturn, revisited probably a dozen times uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and scratching our own heads at times. But you know, the other factor for you know David Fontana coming into it and our business development hat coming on is, is you know, being part of a lot of diligence for for Pfizer and Bristol Myers Squibb and Juno. You know, um, no one really wants to pick up other people's manufacturing, right? Because you know, dealing with CDMOs is great if it's your product, but if it's somebody else's product, and we thought, let's just make this easy for us. By, you know, controlling our own pipeline. One of our big strategies is to do a lot of business development with our technologies. Let's make it easy for our partnerships as well. So what we offer partners is really, we, we can carry you through all your manufacturing woes. And if you want to tech transfer and don't trust Emoja or, or just think we're not you know big enough at a certain time, uh, if you want to go to you know, clinical scale, um, we can do tech transfers. But the real, the real feeling was let's control the whole supply chain, make it as efficient as possible. We've hire just a great group of people who can make these, you know, make this things the economic, economical way and in a very efficient way um, with our facility called Klein. So a, a lot, a lot of strategic insight went into that. And, and of course, again, a lot of revisiting after the economic downturn, but we, we ended up, you know, just today thinking how smart it was, right? We still think it's the right decision. It, it becomes an asset now that we have. I think you probably have heard some others too, you know, that there's a lot of our, our, um, our friends who also do in vivo work, you know, the, a lot of guys from June are at, at Sauna, you know, Steve Haar and the Sauna group, you know, talks a lot about how they've had so many mishaps with their CDMOs, right? They've, it's delayed their clinical, you know, trials as well. And he's building a manufacturing plan as well. I think we're all in the same boat. We've learned our lessons that um, you know, th- there's a talent, you know, there's, there's a talent uh, drain, right? For every CDMO that starts, they're going to pull from another CDMO and you just are training new people all the time. What we've established in Boulder will be sustainable, right? The, just a great group of people who are talented and have been involved now in you know, manufacturing both VB100 and VB200. I think when we get to the partnerships ne- next year and, and beyond, just will we'll pay for itself and over and over again, both in time and efficiency. Yeah. Was that uh, was there anything particularly challenging about that sell to uh, to to the board? I mean. It makes perhaps in retrospect, and mm-hmm. as you as you're you know in in the environment now, it makes perfect sense, and and everyone's everyone's happy. I'm just curious if you can share some stories about how you you know moved that your chief operating officer. A lot of this rolls up to you. How you moved that uh, that decision through the through the board at Umoja, and um, you know what the acceptance level was from from the outset. Yeah, well, well, I had the fortune of joining right like month that the decision was made, so I didn't have much say. In oh, it. you didn't? Yeah, that's, but, but I was very involved in making the the, the um, you know, very supportive of the decision because again, my experiences. You know, I think you know this that um, the autologous cars now are really struggling to treat the number of patients they can treat. Right, Brianzi, for example, or even you know the Kite and Novartis are really limited to probably about thirty percent of the patients they could treat if they could scale manufacturing. Mm-hmm. So we just thought let's, let's solve that problem early, right? Let's just make you know make this a scalable operation in Boulder. We're, we're building out half of our facility, which will cover our needs and for the next five years. But you know, with plans that if if things go well as we anticipate they will, uh, Matt. We, we can scale up and go all the way to commercial manufacturing in Boulder, Colorado. So you know, a lot of thought went into that decision. And, and um, you know, I had a lot of gray hair before, but a lot of gray hair also in, when I joined the company, because was that the right decision is, is you know, still, but, but seeing all the, the, the failures that others are having in the CDMO world, eventually I'm, I'm sure things will get up to speed when there's enough talent and training, but we didn't have time to wait. We, we, we have to move our pipeline forward as did Son and everybody else who is mm-hmm. kind of in this unique space. Let's move forward and, and uh, bite yeah. the bullet and spend the money. From a real estate perspective, there's always a safety net. I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago and there was a discussion around the fact that, uh, you know, any, anytime things don't end up working out for a biopharma that built its own facilities, those, those facilities get snapped <clears throat> up by an outsourcer in a hurry anyway. So uh, there's always that out. Um, yeah. You know, I, right. I set I set this conversation up, David, with uh, sort of a, I don't know, a super high level retrospective on uh, CAR-T therapy, you know, where it's come from, where it's at today. 
in some of the challenges uh, that the space faces moving forward, moving out of out of blood cancer and into solid tumor. Um, so I want to ask you some kind of high level questions about that and get your uh, get your uh, I, I guess response or perspective on how Umoja fits into uh, the the solutions that you know we're after right now. So. I guess the logical place to start with that would be the indications that Umoj is going after because they are indicative of uh, some areas that uh, haven't been perhaps um, super successful arenas for, for CAR-T to date. Yeah, that's a great question. So we're, we're really focused on um, solid tumors at Umoj. And again, I mentioned our tumor tech technology. And I'm going to spend a minute you know, talking about how that just that end of the uh, business end works. It's really what we call our targeting technology where we, we've, we've, we've acquired this from Novartis via endocyte um, from Dr. Phil Lau. So it's a, it's a host of these uh, molecules that are really called tags. So we have a universal car that has uh, basically an anti-fitzy or anti-fluorescene car that we build and it, it, it binds to these tumor tags. And the tumor tags have on one end the fluorescein, which binds to the car and activates it. And then on the other end is the business end where it finds tumors so these you know, relatively cheap, small molecules, and I'll use the example of the UB170, uh, uh, it's a folate tag. It, it gets into the ovarian uh, tumors, it expresses on the surface readily, it washes out the body because it's a small molecule, right? And washes out the body readily. And for, for um, at least a week, these are it's sitting on the surface of the tumor. So Novartis uses as an imaging agent for ovarian cancer. So our play is to use it as a attraction for cars, right? So basically our universal car can find this folate tumor. Now, now uh, folate tag all over the ovarian cancer, bind to it, it cause the uh, immune reaction and basically, you know, um, kill the tumors. But our folate portfolio, the emoji portfolio is really going to be a host of these tumor tags, you know, because we have one for, as I mentioned, we have one for PSMA um, in various tumor microenvironments. The whole idea is that the one alone is probably not going to be enough, um, that we can combine these tags in a cocktail format, you know, to maybe that's like some some areas where there might be hypervasculature, you know, neovasculature, we have a tag against that. We have a tag against the stromal elements of tumors. And so a combination of, of you know, A plus B, along with one car, you know, the hard, the expensive parts making the car, uh, mm -hmm. one car uh, and multiple, you know, relatively cost-effective tags could provide a whole portfolio of, of, of molecules for solid tumor treatments. So that's our main focus on that area. The, the rest of our pipeline is really on how we deliver and sustain those, those um, cells. And so we have our VivaVec, as I mentioned, and it's really nice technology. It's lentiviral vector-based. We're basically delivering RNA and all the components necessary to to um, transform T cells, the, the host T cells, into making, you know, putting our payloads in there. Our payloads are the the, the cars that I mentioned, or and it's our rapamycin um, activated um, system too. We have a system called Racer. That basically the Racer system is an artificial cytokine system that, and it really, really what it does it eliminates the need for lymphodepletion because with when we provide patients with rapamycin or you know monkeys or mice with rapamycin, it for our cells only, it, what it does is delivers an IL-2, IL-15 signal, and the cells grow and um, expand, and, and we can control that with, with the dosing of systemic rapamycin. You know, and rapamycin is a drug that's been on the market. You can even buy it in Europe over the counter for anti-aging, but it's, you know, it's, it's an anti-proliferative agent used for several patients. So what we're trying to do is really say, solve the problems of manufacturing with going in vivo, with all the logistics associated that with cost, and we, that's why we built the manufacturing plant. Um, the persistence problem, like that's the biggest problem, particularly with the um, allogeneic cars right now, you can see, is, you know, the persistence is troublesome. And we can we can get a, around that with our rapamycin and, um, activation system that provides that signal. And then finally, the, the, the solid tumor targeting with our tumor tag approaches is, is really what excites us. That's our, those are our three core technologies kind of in combination, Matt. Yeah. What does the, I guess, administration paradigm look like in, in an ideal world for an, an Emoja CAR-T therapy, um, in, the, the in vivo therapy? So I understand you guys are kind of, you know, map, mapping out or, or working out uh, ex, ex vivo in the process of moving towards in vivo. Is that a correct characterization? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so in an in vivo situation, just give me a, you know, a for a, a, here's a forward looking statement <laughs> around, yeah, no. you know, what that might look like from a patient administration perspective down the road. Yeah. 
Yeah, so our vivovec particles, our, our um, approaches are a couple fold in, in this, and we've spent a lot of energy thinking about this and, and actually investing a little bit of money in a partnership around this as well, uh, work at this. But, you know, the obvious way is to deliver it where the T cells are manufactured into the lymph nodes, right? And so that, that'll probably be one of our initial approaches is let's administer these right into the lymph nodes itself. That's the whole T cell manufacturing machinery is right there, and mm -hmm. we can grow T cells and avoid, you know, and do it most optimally, but also looking at, um, you know, sub subcutaneous administrations, another route of administration that's highly focused, right? It's maybe more uh, tolerable if you, you know, some tumor types might not be amenable to um, the lympho, uh, lymph node administration. So that's another one that's systemic administration. And finally, I'm going to put a little plug in. Um, we have a partnership with a company called Lupagen. So Lupagen has this thing called extracorporeal delivery. Basically what it does, it's a vein to vein system. What we can do with that is hook up a patient to the system. Um, it, it basically collects the uh, the T cells into uh, their, their thing called the sidecar. We can, we can put our um, lentiviral particles, our VivoVec, right into these little bags. It rockers it like you would in manufacturing. We can wash off all of the non-bound particle and deliver, you know, fully bound particles back into the patient's IV um, to the patients. That's our third um, you know, option. So we're, we're really you know, delivery is a, you know, the, a big deal, right? Of course, and I'm glad you asked that question because we've spent a lot of energy with this and quite pleased with our progress, both with lymph node administration and also with the lupagen system. We, you know, we just want to have alternatives because people have their favorites, right? And, and tumors might be amenable. So uh, nothing proprietary there. It's, it's really uh, something we're, we're highly proud of our efforts to, to, to um, exploit as many uh, routes of administration as possible. Yeah. Yeah, good deal. And, and the next question I have for you around efficiency and, and cost is a difficult one to frame up. And I don't anticipate that you're going to give me a, or be able to give me a, a super uh, detailed response, which is totally okay. I'm just looking for some general, I guess, commentary on, you know, you look at, you know, you look at Kim Raya, as I mentioned earlier, back in 2017, I think it was like half a million dollars uh, cost to, to, you know, per, per, per dose. Um, I'm not sure what some of the other CAR T therapies are are, are priced at at this point, um, but obviously it's a it's a big deal, right? Like it's a it's a it's, it's a big deal, and it's a challenge that uh, that the cell and gene space either accepts or or attempts to 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 change as we move forward. Um, this approach portends to have an impact on that, right? To be, uh, to, to be more efficient and ultimately be less of a, a burden to patients and payers. Uh, can you just give us some, some sense, like theoretically or fundamentally, how so? Like, why is it more efficient? Why is it potentially more efficient uh, to move toward, I'm, I'm assuming in vivo is a big, big part of that, but just give us the, the general sense as to why um, it's, it's got the potential to be a more efficient approach. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, it, you know, I do know the numbers pretty well. You know, autologous cars are roughly the uh, market price is about four hundred thousand dollars per therapy. A lot mm -hmm. of that's related to the manufacturing costs, which are roughly two hundred to you know, one hundred fifty to two hundred, which will come down, right? But that's what that's what you know, the kites and the vortices and Bristol Myers Squibb, I'm sure, are paying. You know, the logistic around that is just um, impressive, right? It's almost probably competing with Amazon of of ordering the product and shipping. You imagine somebody in Tokyo gets Aphoris and they ship it all the way to Bothell, Washington, um, and then manufacture it over the month and then have to release it and ship it all the way back. So um, yeah. our technology off the shelf, as you, as you know, is really gonna cut through all those things. And, and you know, our predictions, our models, our, our, our goal is really to cut that cost um, down way, way low. We, we are hoping to get under $1,000 per dose. So one-time treatment again, thousand dollars per dose of manufacturing costs. You know, maybe maybe somewhere between ten thousand and a thousand initially, but you know, down to a thousand versus one hundred and fifty thousand costs today. And that's really one of the foundations of Emoja: make make manufacturing affordable, uh, so we can deliver these to more patients. You know, so it has the off the shelf perspective of cutting the all the logistics off and you know, mm -hmm. broadening the horizons. It has the safety features that we like with our tumor tags. I just want to mention that one of our one of the attractions of our, our technology is that we can stop giving rapamycin and, and kind of it stops the IL-2 growth signal and we can kind of hinder a little bit on if there are patients suffering from you know, CRS or some neurotoxic events. But we can also, with our tumor tags, just basically administer fluorescein. And fluorescein, you know, it's, it's given as an imaging agent, will basically mop up all the tags and stop the immune system from activating the car. So we really have a lot of safety nets built in our technologies 
with the hope that we can get this out to more patients in the community setting and more environments, which the car, you know, the current cars, including Brianzi, have made headways to, but again, they're still limited to about 20% of the available patients because of the limitations of cost, you know, administration, uh, logistics, and just site availability you know, mm -hmm. and availability of sites. We're really trying to get through all that stuff with our technology. Long way to go, but, you know, a lot of hope and uh, lots of good energy and smart people working on it. For sure. Yeah. What does the competitive set look like in, in this, in this space? I mean, is it, I, you know, I, my perception is that there's a growing, uh, you know, a growing industry of new and emerging biotechs who are, are focused on this, uh, this concept of, of, well, two, two, I guess one in vivo, but also, you know, there are a lot of people trying to move, uh, the, the efficacy of CAR T therapy into solid tumor. Um, so how does that kind of affect where, where Umoja goes from here? Yeah, yeah. The, just focusing on in vivo, um, you're absolutely right. There, there was probably a handful of competitors when I joined 18 months ago, and I was at the, uh, the cell CAR T uh, conference in Boston a few weeks back, and there, there were 20 companies I've never even heard of, uh, kind of in, in this almost exact identical space, which I think is great. Like the, yeah. the more the more we can share and learn, you know, the better. And, and uh, you know, we're, we're not uh, the the interesting part is really our our uh, partnering uh, technology, partnering platforms too. What we're really looking to do and what we're, we're, we're trying to do effectively is a concept I call OPC. It's basically other people's cars. So we're, we're, we're working, you know, to the idea would be that, you know, Bristol Myers has you know, a, a sexy new set of uh, cars they'd like to put in vivo. We can work with them and put them into our vivo back racer system and basically develop world-class you know, technologies to be able to deliver. Our goal is not to do the drug development for them, but to get them to IND, which, you know, again, I mentioned Emoji has a lot of experience with that. So that's mm -hmm. that's the one um, area I'm really excited about is our, our opportunity to partner these technologies and, and move forward with that one. As far as the solid tumors, and, and a lot of the partnering is going to be related to solid tumors, right? Who has the you know the the neat solid tumor targets that want to deliver in vivo? You know, it, it'd be hard sell right now to really start a, a you know autologous program, right? When you've got all the allogeneic programs, and so so I think some of the early adopters will come and say, let's get right into in vivo uh, technology and take a swag. And if, if Emoja is the right uh, you know, company, it's, it's a big win for everybody. Our tumor tag technology is really unique. I think that's that's one of the biggest differentiators and frankly, why I joined. I, 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 I probably explained it wrong for the first three months I was there now with a good solid foundation of it. It's really this cocktail approach of being able to, to understand you know, tackling the different tumor elements in a way with an in vivo cell therapy. Um, it's just very unique. And, and the reason why I'm still working instead of spending most of my time in France with my wife, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, well. it's motivating to me to, I can't really can't wait till our IND for this VV 200 plus the 170 tumor tag will be filed the tail end of next year. Yeah. So you know, second half of next year, just excited to get that into the clinic and, and, and to explore patients. And you, you, you talked about indications. I avoided a bit. We're, we're going to start in gynecological cancers. You know, the, there's been some evidence now for the this is the 170 is a folate tag. That there's been some nice data coming out of uh, ADCs with with the immunogen, for example, with the folate uh, receptor uh, that they're they're tackling. And so they'll, they'll they'll be on the market and approved with an ADC. But you know the cell therapies just have a you know just a better attractive uh, profile. There just seems to be better efficacy with cell therapies if you just compare it. CD19 ADCs versus the autologous cars. I think it's a better approach. So we're excited about the fact that they've proved concept for us that folate, you know, drug can work in that space. And we're just going to come in and, and see what, what uh, good we can do for those patients and gyne gynecological cancers to start with, then moving into more of the, of the broad cancers like uh, head and neck cancer. There's a lot of folate and head and neck cancer. And um, as I mentioned, we have a PSMA a tumor tag as well. So we'll start looking at where those can play as well and do cocktail studies into 24 and 25s. Matt, mm -hmm. that's our plan. Yeah, very good. Very good. Well, they're big, big patient populations in those indications. And, uh, you know, if you can, if you can, um, if, you, if you can tackle the the manufacturing challenges, I mean, mm -hmm. there, there, there's an absolute, uh, obviously an absolute market opportunity there and patient opportunity to improve lives. I mean, that's a, that's a growing area. As I was just having a conversation recently with uh, some folks about some of the HPV driven uh, head and neck cancers and solid tumors um, that uh, for the next three decades, I think we're anticipating are going to be a, a big deal until the HPV vaccine, you know, yeah. kicks in and has an impact on the, on the, on the population that's received it. So um, definitely, definitely big need. Yeah, absolutely. We're yeah. really excited about our portfolio. Just really excited about the opportunity to uh, 
you know, to um, play play in the heme space. So that's the other thing I just want to mention. You know, we, we decided um, to to out, out, uh, out license our VV100 program. The, the simple thinking behind that is that you know um, to go into non uh, to go into the NHL space or multiple myeloma take, takes a big pharma engine right now, right? That uh, something with the global access to patients and uh, you know the know how that big pharma can bring to it. So we're looking to to partner most of our heme uh, and, and let it be driven by big pharma. Where we focus focus on our integrated technology with the tumor tags. We just think it's something, you know, ovarian cancer with our tumor tag in late lines, something we can really tackle as a company, but but trying to go against uh, the, the kites, Novartis's and Bristol-Myers Squibb and the CD19 space. Why not join them instead of fight against them, right? That was our thinking behind this. And that's what we're really aggressively trying to do is let's pair up. We bring the in vivo technology and the racer technology. They can bring the know-how with the binders. And uh, you know the dual dual target binders, nineteen twenty two, and uh, or you know, BCMA TASI, however they want to handle it. You know they can bring that part in the development engine. We can bring the ID engine. I think that's I mentioned early on. We started with partnerships. Mm -hmm. Kind of another thing I'm excited about it is bringing the best of both worlds together. What we do well, um, and what they do well, I think will bring uh, best benefit to patients. Yeah, I like it. Well, we'll have you. We'll we'll do a part two and have you both back on so we can talk about progress when uh, we move that ball a little bit further down the field. Um, but in the meantime, we're we're running short on time here, Doctor Fontana. What haven't I What haven't I asked you that uh, that I should have? I'm gonna give you an opportunity to correct my my poor interviewing skills. No, I'd like to come back and spend a little bit more time on the technologies. I I felt I did a, a little bit of a, a disservice to our great technologies we have. You know, it's just it's really. Great stuff, and and I mentioned our, our uh, focus on manufacturing. We also have uh, a set of technologies that are getting it's getting getting more attractive. We're basically using our racer technology again, ability to grow cells with rapamycin for iPSC cells. So we have a great uh, portfolio now of INK uh, derived um, cells, which we can manufacture again. The whole democratizing manufacturing it, you know it. Uh, thousands of times more productive than than our competitors can do. It's not a, a large focus of the company, but again, it's a, it's capitalizing on our racer technology, and again with the goal of partnering partnering that out. So that that'll be a great next follow up when we uh, make more progress on showing how we can really manufacture iPSC cells uh, in a, a, a really sexy way and a way that can uh, can, can benefit patients at low cost and, and low burden to the. Uh, Health, health economic system of the world. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll definitely do that. I've, I've, I've made a note for part two. We'll, we'll regroup on <laughs> right. that. But I appreciate the time, Dr. Fontana. It's been a pleasure talking with you. I've enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, we look, we look forward to following along with the story at Umoja. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Enjoyed your time. Thank you. So that's Umoja Biopharma's Dr. David Fontana. I'm Matt Piller, and this is the Business of Biotech. We're produced by Bioprocess Online in partnership with Cytiva. Check us out at bioprocessonline.com and check Cytiva out at cytiva.com backslash emerging biotech. Both sites offer troves of content dedicated to emerging and early stage biotechs. And if you like tuning into conversations with biotech innovators like Dr. Fontana, make sure you subscribe to the pod. We drop every Monday. We'd love to hear from you. So leave us a comment or review. And in the meantime, and as always, thanks for listening. <laughs>